Hey, I'm excited to be here. We are in a, uh, a series called The Aftermath, and we've been looking at the events following the resurrection of Jesus, the period between uh, when he was resurrected and when he ascended into heaven. In the last three weeks, Pastor Jordan's been covering some different stories. It's been an incredible series. Uh, I would encourage you to check out any weeks that you've missed. I'm a big believer in that. When we put together a series, we put it together as a series for a reason. Uh, all the messages are intertwined and tied together, and they're meant to be taken as a series. So if you've missed any of those, go back and check them out. I think it just helps you uh, provide context and really get a grasp on what we're really going after when we do a series. So that's the aftermath. I had the pleasure this morning of uh, wrapping that series up. Um, and I want to read a couple of verses to start off with. We're going to look at these verses really quickly. I'm going to highlight a couple areas very briefly. We're going to come back to them later on and really focus on them, but I want to get them out front. And so the first one is from the Luke's Gospel. It was actually shared last week, uh, Luke 24, 49. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples, and he says this, And look, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but wait. Uh, and it, it says on the screen, uh, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. In my translation it says, but wait. So if you put the word wait in all caps, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. The next verse is Acts 1-4, and it's Luke writing again, and he's recapping this event. And he's saying, on one occasion, while he, meaning Jesus, was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait, again, all caps, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. And that's Acts 1-4. So again, a couple verses, we're going to come back to them, so hold those in your mind. How many of you know uh, that patience is not a virtue our society seems to favor, right? Most of us, few of us, probably none of us, like to wait. Uh, we do not like to wait in traffic. Last Sunday on my way here, I knew that the Drake half, re Relays Half Marathon was going on, and I happened to live in Beaverdale. And I knew that there was a chance that I would encounter it, so I needed to take an alternate route. Now, you can't tell this now, but I have run that race a few times in the past. And I thought that I knew the route, and so I decided if I get to Hickman and on the way, all the way here by a certain time, I should be totally fine. Little did I know they changed the route. And so I got to Hickman on 55th Street, and the, the police were there. And they had stopped traffic, and I got there at 8.20 precisely. And I thought, I'm gonna, I know I'm preaching on waiting next Sunday, so let me check and see how long I have to wait. At 8.20, I was stopped in Hickman. At 8.37, I had not moved. 17 minutes of not moving at all. How many of you know that feels like an hour and a half? It's just pure agony. And so I sat there, and I actually had to get out of line in traffic, turn around, take an alternate route to get here by the 9 o'clock service so I, could, so I could be here on time. It was crazy. We hate waiting in, in traffic. We don't like waiting in line at the supermarket. Uh, how many of you, when you get up and you have your groceries and you get up and it's time to check out, you look for the longest line? Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Nobody says, I've got like a spare 20 minutes today, nothing better to do. I think I'll wait in the longest line. That just does not happen. You find the shortest line, and then when you get in line, you have anxiety that other lines might be moving faster than yours. How, nobody, I mean, come on, honestly, we all look and we're like, oh, they're a little bit ahead. Oh, they're a little bit. I had somebody after the first service tell me, when we go to the grocery store, my husband and I, we both get in two different lines. And then whichever line is moving fastest, then we, we go over to that one. I'm like, that's extreme, okay? So we don't like waiting in line at the grocery store. We don't like waiting at the airport, all right? My wife and I went on vacation last summer, and we were flying Des Moines to Phoenix. That's where our connecting flight was, was in Phoenix. We flew Des Moines to Phoenix, and we had to sit while they repaired some piece of the airplane. We had to sit and wait for an hour, hour and a half, just in the plane, sitting down. And how many of you have been there with nothing to do? You're just looking around like, oh my gosh, like when's this going to end? Hurry up. It feels like hours and hours and hours. Your hands start to sweat, at least mine do anyway. I have this like sort of anxiety that comes over me like, let's just get moving. Let's get to where we're going. We don't like to wait uh, when our phones are not working and they're moving slow or our computers aren't moving fast enough. How many of you are, you know, remember the days of the dial-up internet where you'd have the ding, ding, whatever that sound was. 
that happened, and you'd finally get online, and it was like the greatest thing ever, and then you'd surf the web, and it'd take like five minutes for a website to load. I mean, that wasn't that long ago, but if those days were now, we would be distraught beside ourselves. We thought that it was so great back then. You could get online and look at this stuff. And remember what would happen if somebody picked up the phone, it would disconnect you? And you were like, no, no, like, come on. He just took me offline. It's so terrible. Oh, we're so spoiled nowadays. But we get, we get upset when things don't work fast enough, you know. There's actually a doctor in Dallas, uh, from Dallas, by the name of Dr. Larry Dossey. And he has coined a term that describes this problem that we have in modern-day America. And people who hate to wait suffer from what he calls hurry sickness. And hurry sickness he defines as an increased sensitivity to the passage of time. So he believes that people who are suffering from hurry sickness actually die earlier than they should. So we're going to do a little experiment here. So what I want you to do, all you have to do for this is close your eyes, if you would uh, be so inclined. Close your eyes tightly. What I want you to do is this. When I say go, I want you to do your best to guess how long a minute is. Now, don't try to cheat and count. I just want you to go by your gut instinct, your, your feel here. So I'm going to say go, and when you think that one minute has passed, I want you to slip your hand up, okay? Eyes closed. You're just going to guess how long you think a minute is. Slip your hand up when you think it's passed, and we're going to talk about that. So, all right, on your marks, get set, let's go. Just keep your hands up as you. And stop. All right, you can put your hands down. I will tell you right now, this service is way more impatient than the last one. We had hands, the earliest that we had a hand up in the first service was 35 seconds. We had hands up at 22 seconds in this service, and we had a lot of hands up by 40, a lot of hands up by 40 seconds. So you guys, we're going to have some talk here, all right? We're going to have some counseling right now for the next half hour or so. So... Dr. Dossey says that a person, for a person suffering from hurry sickness, a minute uh, actually, fe what feels like a minute is actually 15 seconds. 15 seconds. So some of you are at 22. So we'll talk after service, uh, and I'll take you through. But if you feel like you have hurry sickness, you're not alone. You know, I was chatting with some people between services, and it's kind of like we're almost forced into this, aren't we, at times? Like our society is just sort of tailored in such a way that it's hard not to feel like you're always in a hurry, like you're always rushed. So you're certainly not alone if you feel like you have this. Um, hurry sickness, Dr. Dossie says, is especially prevalent among highly motivated, achievement-oriented people. So those of you that raise your hands early, maybe you're like, all right, awesome, I got, I got this. Uh, but it often sets in around age 30, and it gets worse in the passing years. So what happens uh, if it's left untreated or left unchecked? There's actually a series of ailments that is sort of uh, as a result of hurry sickness. One is ulcers. Uh, high blood pressure, tension headaches, high cholesterol, and a lowered resistance to disease. All symptoms of a hurry sickness. The eventual payoff, Dr. Dossie says, is a heart attack. Uh, not exactly a good prognosis for hurry sickness. What he doesn't mention is just as bad. Anxiety, a frustrated spouse, neglected children, a deteriorating spiritual life, and a short temper. You do more, work harder, run faster, and you wind up in an early grave doesn't really seem worth it, does it? And still people talk about having their plates too full, having too much going on, living life in the fast lane, not having enough hours in the day. Can anyone relate to this? 
Or I, is everybody like, no, I've got so much time on my hands. I don't know what to do with it. I never feel rushed. It's just me and God for like four hours a day just chilling. Like, no, I don't think that you feel, feel that way. We want to slow down. All of us want to slow down, but we're afraid the world will fall apart if we do. You know, most of us would rather do anything but wait. But the truth is that most of life is waiting. You know, one of the hardest parts of the Christian life is waiting. It seems like for every green light that God gives us, there are half a dozen yellow and a dozen red. Maybe that's just me, but that's, that's how it's felt. If you want a fascinating Bible study, take a Bible concordance and look up the word wait. Over and over again, God's people were told to wait. Let me read just a few verses uh, that have the word wait in them in the Bible. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait before the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Twice it says to wait. Psalm 37, 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Proverbs 20, 22, do not say, I will pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord and he will deliver you. Isaiah 30, 18, for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. So that one tells us that we're blessed if we're able to wait for him. And then maybe the most famous verse of all uh, when it comes to waiting is Isaiah 40, 31. But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So those, those that wait upon the Lord. So with all those verses and that stuff as a background, we turn to our text, Acts 1, 4. We go back to it. Luke tells us that on one occasion, <clears throat> excuse me, after his resurrection, the disciples and Jesus shared a meal together. And the conversation turned to the future, to the time when Jesus would return to heaven and the disciples would be left with orders to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. It's easy to imagine the excitement around the table that day, isn't it? Here's this group of disciples who not long beforehand were completely disoriented, were frustrated, were afraid, were terrified, thought that their Messiah, their master, was killed, was dead and gone. And now he's been resurrected in power. And they've seen amazing things. He's offered these proofs to them. And they're spending time with him and eating meals with him. And now he tells them, you are going to be my witnesses to the end of the earth. Imagine the transformation that had to take place in their hearts at that point in time. They were just ecstatic. They were ready to go. Remember, these are young, brash disciples. Young guys, and they're pumped up. They're ready to go. They probably started thinking, all right, what do we do here? What's our plan? James and John, you guys, you guys get on the mission statement. All right, draft up a mission statement, get our vision, get our values, get everything in line. We really need this if we're going to minister to these people and make a movement. Get, your, get our mission, vision, and values lined up. Peter, work out a 10-year strategy. Give us a timeline for church growth. Get us to figure out how we're going to get the most people in, how we're going to do all these things. All right, Matthew, you're an accountant, aren't you? Why don't you run some numbers? All right, get it figured out. What kind of money do we need here? How are we going to divide the money up? What kind of budget do we need? Lord, where do you want us to begin? Let's get the ball rolling on this thing. But his answer is simple, and it's shocking to these zealous disciples. Right? Don't do anything yet, but go back to Jerusalem and wait there till the Holy Spirit comes. I'm sure this must have come as a major surprise to these guys because they were ready to rock and roll, and Jesus says instead, I want you just to wait Here's a crucial insight for those of you that are note takers. It'll be on the screen. When God wants to reach the world, his first step is to tell his people to slow down and wait for him. When God wants to reach the world, his first step is to tell his people to slow down and wait for him. You see this throughout the Bible over and over again. I can't go into all of it today, but it's, it's wait. When the time comes, he'll give the signal to move out. Until then, go back and wait. And this raises a question, why did the disciples have to wait for what God had already promised them? He'd already said, Jesus had already said, the Holy Spirit is coming. When I leave, he's going to come, and it's going to be amazing. So why did they have to wait for this thing that God had already promised them? Why couldn't they just, quote unquote, name it and claim it? Why couldn't they just say, we've got your promise, let's just drag it down from heaven to earth. Here we go, all right, let's rock and roll. Why couldn't they just make it happen? Well, from this text and from the Bible as a whole, 
we discover at least five reasons, and I'm going to focus on five this morning, but at least five reasons why God tells his people to wait on him consistently throughout the biblical narrative. So here's the first of five reasons why God oftentimes forces us to wait. The first one is to rearrange our priorities. To rearrange our priorities. Jesus commanded the disciples in Acts 1-4 to stay where? In Jerusalem. We take that maybe for granted and think, oh, okay, no big deal. That's where they were living at the time. Think about this. This is the city that had just crucified Jesus. This is the last place where many of them wanted to be. The men who put him to death a few weeks earlier were still in power there. Not much had changed. Certainly all the uproar surrounding his death would have made them even more angry. Jerusalem was no longer a safe city. If it wasn't safe for Jesus, how could it be safe for his followers? In fact, if you were a follower of Jesus at this time, any place on earth was safer for you than Jerusalem was. Getting out of town was not a bad idea, but Jesus commanded them to stay. If they left, it would show a lack of courage and reveal a fear of what man might do to them. It would also show a lack of faith as if they could not trust Jesus to help them. It would mean leaving the battlefield and admitting defeat, and this they could not do. There's another argument they might have made. They could have said, look, Jesus, Jerusalem has already heard about you, and they've crucified you. They put you to death. They murdered you. The rest of the world needs to know, send us out now. Send us to other places where we can tell them about you first. Let's go somewhere else and spread the good news. That would be a good argument, very logical. It would also be very wrong. In serving the Lord, timing is all important. Timing is all important. Expediency gains nothing if God isn't leading us. See, their duty was to follow, not to lead. By staying in Jerusalem, Jesus forces them to confront their fears. That's a hard thing for us to do. Waiting is hard for all of us type A, action-oriented people who want to make things happen. There are times in life when God says, slow down, you're going too fast. I don't want you in the fast lane right now. Let's get off of the next exit and talk it over. And when that happens, our response is usually not, Jesus, take the wheel. Right? Famous Carrie Underwood song, it usually is not how it goes. We usually don't just instantly offer that up and surrender our wills to him. Usually, we keep our hands grip tight. Maybe we tighten our grip even a little bit more, 10 and 2, right? White knuckle in it. And we say, hey, I'm going to keep driving. Why don't you just go ahead and talk while I keep driving and doing my thing? I'll fit you in somewhere. And suddenly, though, another hand takes the wheel. And we find ourselves heading towards the exit. I preached on this about a month ago about the correction and discipline of the Lord. It's the hand of God using the circumstances of our lives to get our attention, to slow us down, to make us wait. See, waiting rearranges our priorities slows down our schedule and forces us to listen to God. Has anybody ever been there? So the first thing is to rearrange our priorities. Next, we have to wait oftentimes because it tests our faith. To test our faith. Jesus gave specific instructions in three areas. He told them what to do. He said, wait. He told them where to do it. He said, Jerusalem. And he told them what to wait for the promise of the Father, the coming of the Holy Spirit. But here's what's crazy to me, and this is the most agonizing part. He didn't tell them how long to wait. <laughs> he didn't tell them how long to wait. They had no idea whether they should wait a week, a month, a year, 10 years, or 40 years. I don't know about you, but for me, if I know I have to wait a certain amount of time, it takes so much of the pain out of it. Even if it's long, even if it's hard, even if at times it challenges me, at least I know, okay, I've got a six-hour layover here at the airport. It's going to be boring. I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's, only, it's six hours, and it'll be done. As opposed to you get there and you go, well, we don't know when your plane's going to get in. Uh, we're not sure right now. We have no clue. Just sit around, and we'll figure it out. It's really hard to wait when you have no idea how long you're going to wait you know, I think of some of the great characters of the Old Testament, of King David, of Joseph. Joseph's my favorite story. But I think about King David, anointed king at 16, 17, 18 years old, something like that. This promise from God that he would be king of Israel someday. And what does he do for the next 13, 14 years? 
He's hiding in caves, running for his life from King Saul. Joseph has this dream at age 17 that he would be a ruler of nations, that he would, he would stand up high someday. And what does he do for the next 13, 14 years? He sits away in prison, feeling like he's rotting away. I have to imagine how difficult it was for these guys in these situations. You know, sometimes we want to take these characters of the Old Testament and we want to make them saints as if they're not human. These were young men who were very, very human, 17, 18, 19-year-old young guys that had promises from God but felt like they were wasting away. I imagine Joseph thought to himself many times, Lord, what are you doing here? What are you doing? You told me that I would be a ruler of nations and now I'm in prison? The best years of my life are wasting away. How am I going to get out of this? I don't see any hope. He had to doubt at times, did I dream wrong? Did I hear wrong? Did I think incorrectly? Is this promise from God not really a promise from God? What's going on? There were, according to the Bible, there weren't really any other words. It says the Lord was with him. But we don't know what that looks like exactly. There had to be many dark days. The same with David. He had to think, did Samuel get it wrong when he anointed me? Was I the wrong choice? What's going on? Why am I running from my life? Why am I in fear here? I'm hiding in caves? This isn't what a king does. How many of you can relate to this? Where you had some kind of promise from God or a season from God where you're like, have I heard incorrectly? Have I trusted God incorrectly? That what I think was supposed to come to pass is not really coming to pass because right now all I feel like is death. I feel like I'm rotting away. These are years of my life, God, that you could use for your kingdom. Why aren't you using me? Why am I sitting here in this place doing seemingly nothing? What is going on? Some of us are in the same place right now as that, as David and Joseph probably got to, as disciples may have gotten to, without knowing how long we're supposed to wait. We want to see a change in our life. Something is feeling like it's ready to crush us or break us, and we're wondering how much longer can we hold out? How much longer can we hold out? We feel like giving up and walking away from our dreams. We wonder if prayer is a waste of time because God has not answered us. We're in dire straits. I mean, maybe you've been waiting for months or years already, and deep inside you feel like giving up. Let me encourage you to not give up, to keep waiting, to say, Lord, I'm going to wait on you even if it takes forever to remain steadfast in these moments. And I know, believe me, I'll talk about this in a few minutes, but it's easier said than done. So I don't say that as a cliche or a platitude like, hey, just don't give up. No big deal. Just keep waiting. I understand the sheer amount of will that takes sometimes to not give up, just to keep waiting when you don't see God moving in the ways that you expected him to move. So the first one is to rearrange our priorities. Second, tests our faith when we wait. Third, it's a lot like the second one, but it purifies our motives. Waiting purifies our motives. Very soon the disciples would be asked to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Huge responsibilities would fall on them. Much would be required. Much would be expected of them. And of all the dangers they faced, perhaps none was greater than the danger of pride. Let's remember who these guys were. Very young men when they were called. Very young men. And they had seen and done amazing things. They had worked miracles. They had seen demons driven out. They had seen Jesus raise the dead. They were followers of the rabbi of rabbis. In their own eyes, there was temptation to be very full of pride. James and John at one point said, Jesus do you want us to call down fire on this city? It's such a crazy thing to think, but what's crazier is they thought they could do that, which is a whole other sermon right there. But Peter says, even if everybody else denies, I won't deny. Jesus, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom? Right? These guys were already young, brash, sort of arrogant at times, full of pride. Now there's this temptation towards pride. If they're going to go out to be witnesses, there's a temptation for them to think it's going to be all through us. Yep, we're followers of the rabbi of rabbis. Jesus is raised from the dead. He's resurrected. He's full of power. And we're his followers. Let's go do it, guys. Like I said earlier, let's put together the mission statement, the vision, the values, 10-year growth plan, the budget. Let's go do this. It's all about us. We've got talent amongst us. Let's go do this thing. Temptation towards pride, but it purifies their motives to have to wait. Because unbeknownst to them, in just a few days, thousands and thousands of people 
would be converted at one time. So to think, so to keep them from thinking that everything depended upon them, God makes them wait. Waiting would force them into a position of humility, waiting for the promise of the Father. Because Jesus knew that without the power of the Spirit, everything else they did would be in vain. But with the Spirit, all things are possible. You know, all of us have to come to the same place of utter helplessness before we can experience the fullness of the Spirit. Here's another thing on the screen for you if you're a note taker. God wants to bring you to the place where you know that you do not know. This place of humility. He wants to bring you to this place where you know that you do not know. Now, this is a painful place to get to. So I don't care who you are, but there's enough pride, enough of us and us. Things have to be broken down before we arrive at this place. But God loves us too much to leave us alone, and he wants to to bring us to this place where we know that we don't know. He arranges your life so that you understand that you do not understand. He wants to bring you to the end of yourself so that your trust will be in him alone. Now, waiting purifies our motives because in the long hours while we wait, our pride crumbles and we realize that everything depends upon God. It's a beautiful place to be and it's a hard place to get to. Maybe some of you are feeling like that right now, like I'm in a place in my life where I know less than I've ever known, where I understand less than I've ever understood. All right, that's awesome. You may feel like garbage about that, but that's an awesome place to be. It's where God shows up and meets you in this waiting. Reason number four, he makes us wait to increase our gratitude. To increase our gratitude. This point is similar to the last one. The longer the disciples waited for the Spirit to fall, the more they appreciated the answer when it finally came. And this is one of the reasons why our prayers usually aren't answered the first time that we pray them, because God is not a vending machine. We don't just pop in our 50 cents or whatever it is nowadays, 75 cents, and hit A2, and out comes the Snickers. All right? That's not how it works. That's just my favorite. I don't know what yours is, but in the first service, Snickers got an amen, just so, just so you know. <laughs> Snickers bars got an amen. But it doesn't work like that. God's our Heavenly Father. He makes us wait so that our gratitude might increase. Here's something you may have never considered. When God puts us in a position of waiting on him, the answer almost always surprises us. You know, consider the situation in Acts 1. Jesus told the disciples to wait for the promise of the Father, the coming of the Holy Spirit. So for days they prayed, O oh, oh Lord, send your Spirit. They prayed in small groups, O oh, Lord, send the Holy Spirit. They probably lifted their hands and prayed, O oh, Lord, send the Holy Spirit. They knew something about the Holy Spirit from the Old Testament and a little bit more about him from Jesus, but did you think they understood the fullness of what was actually going to happen? No way. They didn't really know what they were praying for. There's an old song, right, by Garth Brooks, Unanswered Prayers. Anybody remember that one? Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. How many times have you prayed, you know, one day, and it doesn't answer, two days, and there's no answer, three days, no answer, four days, this keeps going, and you're praying and praying and praying and praying for this thing, and you're pressing in for weeks and months and maybe years, and you don't understand why it's not being answered. Then the answer comes, and you think to yourself, I'm so glad that wasn't answered on day one. I'm so glad it wasn't answered the way that I want it to be answered way back when. If it was, it wouldn't have been as great as it is now. And I'm not saying everything always works out exactly the way that you want it to. We, we know that. It's not how it works. But I'm talking about when you're praying for something specific and God answers and shows up. You're like, man, I'm so glad that he didn't answer that first time because I wouldn't have been ready for it. I would have been able to, to deal with it. Or that's not the thing I really wanted. This waiting has refined me so much. You know, the disciples certainly had no idea what was about to happen on Pentecost. I can imagine this conversation going on. Guys, we've been praying. How much longer do we have to pray? I don't know. Well, how are we going to know when the Holy Spirit comes? I don't know. What if the Holy Spirit shows up and we miss it? I don't know. Just, just keep praying. So there, there, there they were on the day of Pentecost, praying, no doubt, 
as they were told to do, not knowing when the Holy Spirit would be sent. And one disciple says to another, hey, I encourage you to read this story, but they say, hey, there's fire coming out of the top of your head. The other one says to the other, well, hey, it's happening to you too. What's going on? Then came a noise, we're told, like a mighty rushing wind. And suddenly one of them started talking in Greek. Another in Median, another in Parthian, another in Egyptian, another in the dialect of Cappadocia. And none of them knew any of those languages. We're told they were uneducated men, yet here they are speaking in these languages. And people in the city began to understand them because they were gathered together for Pentecost. It was a wild scene in Jerusalem as the Holy Spirit came with great power. Their prayers were answered, but in a manner far beyond their expectations. He's the God of great surprises. He makes us wait so that he can surprise us in the future and increase our gratitude when the answer finally comes. Finally, the last, the fifth one, is to remind us that he is God and we are not. Anybody ever had to learn this lesson? <laughs> it's tough for those of us that suffer from hurry sickness, that are the type A overachievers, get things done, I can make it happen, pull myself up by my own bootstraps. It's tough for us to learn this lesson that he is God and we are not. The only way we can learn this, I think, is through the pain of waiting. Jesus told those disciples who were there two things that must have been hard to hear. Stay in Jerusalem. Again, we talked about that, why that would have been so hard. And then wait. Wait for the promise of the Father. Luke tells us that he commanded them to do those two things. These weren't a suggestion. They weren't a, well, if you, if you think about it and you want to do these things, go ahead. No, these were a command. These were from a superior to a group of inferiors. It's God telling his servants what to do. And because God is God and we are not, he often does things, <laughs> this isn't on the screen, but it's so true, he often does things that make little sense to us. Has anybody ever been in that season? I know that I have. This is a deeply personal message for me because I've been in a season of waiting for over a year now where God is just not sometimes making sense to me, where I'm like, what are you doing here, Lord? I don't get it. Your movements are strange to me. Pastor Jordan talked about this a couple weeks ago, and it was so, so good. The disciples on the road to Emmaus and how sometimes in the aftermath, in these seasons, God purposefully hides himself from us. Anybody felt like that? <laughs> where you're doing all the right things, you're you're in the Word, and you're praying, and you're doing your quiet times, and you're doing all the things you know how to do. You're checking all the boxes. But it seems like every time, all that comes back is, just wait. You're praying the prayers, and you're coming to church, and you're serving, and you're giving, and you're reaching out, all, and it just feels like you're disconnected, disoriented, and you just keep feeling like all God's saying is just wait. And you're asking for more clarity, and clarity doesn't come, and all you get is just wait. Just wait. There are times in the Christian life when God's only command to us is to wait. And I know that's how my wife and I felt in this season. In her prayer time, she's felt like God just repeatedly has said, just wait. I'm like, come on. <laughs> come on, we got to get more than that. When those moments come, God rarely explains himself or makes the big picture clear. Because if we had clarity, it wouldn't produce in us what it needs to produce. If he said, hey, I need you to wait uh, exactly two months and at the end of two months, I'm going to do this. How many of you know it wouldn't refine us at all? It wouldn't produce in us what he needs to produce. It wouldn't purify our motives. It wouldn't increase our gratitude. It wouldn't challenge us and change us and shape us in the ways that we need to be challenged and changed and shaped. We would just take it for granted. We would say, all right, two months. All right, while it's coming, I know it's coming. So while it's coming, I'll just do what I want. It wouldn't test our faith at all. It's really, really difficult, isn't it? Waiting. I was thinking about the last two messages I've preached here. One is on the discipline and correction of the Lord, and now I'm preaching on waiting. Like, I don't have the, the you know, fun topics, so to speak. 
Topics that generate all the amens, the rah rah sis boom ba, like cheerlead, love of God, power of God. Let's go after the city and work miracles and do all these things. It's like, nope, discipline of the Lord, and you have to wait. And I'm just preaching. What's that? Giving is my next message, yes. <laughs> that'll, that'll somehow fall on me. <laughs> Jordan will be sick that week, and uh, no, exactly. But the truth is, these are the things that produce Christian maturity. And we, we have to grow up in Christ, right? We don't want to stay babies. We don't want to just drink milk. We want to be able to handle meat, and this is meat. These are the things that have to be done. So you may be waiting on God right now. You may be in a season where you're like, Josh, I can so relate to this. This is so speaking to me. I feel like I've been waiting for this promise of God to come for forever. I feel like I've been trying to get out of this job for forever. I feel like I've been waiting for this financial breakthrough for forever. I feel like I've been waiting for this marriage to be restored and healed for forever. And I'm crying out to God and I'm praying and I'm doing all these things that I've been told to do, but it still feels like the only thing I can hear is just wait. What am I supposed to do? There's a whole other sermon that I could preach here called Waiting Well. Maybe I will at some point, but for the sake of time, let me just highlight a few things and then we'll be done. What should you do if you're waiting on God? The first thing is don't rebel against the Lord. Don't rebel against the Lord. Don't grow bitter. Don't lose heart. Don't faint or grow weary. Don't give up on doing good. All the things that you've been doing, keep doing them. And I believe me when I say this, I don't see it, say those things as like flippantly like just keep doing it I've been through the ringer when it comes to this stuff where I feel like I'm stuck in mud right and for me to keep doing good to keep my head up to not rebel against the Lord to stay encouraged is like a big huge challenge it takes Herculean effort sometimes just to put one foot in front of the other and keep moving when you're waiting on something to happen so I don't say those things that's not trite that's not just this pat advice that I want you to be like, oh, that was nice, but Josh, you don't know what I'm going through. You're right, I don't, <laughs> but I do know what I've gone through, and that's how I know how, I believe I know how hard that stuff is in those seasons. So don't rebel against the Lord. Don't panic. And that one is, that one is hard for me because with hurry sickness, not liking to wait. We're waiting and we think, it's not happening. All right, how am I going to make it happen? All right, I've got to get this money by this time and this has to happen. And I've got to get this A to B and I've got to figure all these things out. How am I going to do this? All right, where's our action plan? Where's our you know, action items? What are we going to do? And we panic. We generate anxiety. And obviously that doesn't do us any good. It's so hard to, to be still and know he is God. It's sl so hard just to slow down and say, okay, I'm going to wait. The third one is don't take matters into your own hands. There's a story in the Old Testament of Abraham. He had this promise from God that he would be made into great nations, but he had to wait for it, and he took matters into his own hands at one point. And it didn't work out so well for him. Don't take matters into your own hands. So don't rebel. Don't panic. Don't take matters into your own hands. Do your duty each day as God shows it to you. Surrender your life to the Lord and say, Lord, your will be done. And again, I understand how hard this stuff is. A lot of you are sitting here like, but what should I do while I wait? That's a perfectly American question to ask. So that's okay. You know, we want to do something. We don't just want to sit in silence. Here's something to take away from this morning for those of you that are in a waiting season. The best way to get ready for tomorrow is to do God's will today. The best way to get ready for tomorrow is to do God's will today. A couple things that have been huge for me in this season, and again, they've not been easy, but before you get out of bed each morning, pray this prayer, something like it anyway. Lord, help me to do my tasks today with joy. Help me to do my tasks today with joy. How many of you know when you're in your waiting season, joy is not easy to come by? Sometimes joy feels far away and you're searching for it in every, every corner of every room, but it's elusive. Lord, help me to do my tasks with joy. Help me to operate from this place where you've got me. Where I know I'm loved by you and I can go about things with joy and integrity. And I would pray bigger and bolder prayers, which I know is counterintuitive to you in these seasons. I've been in this waiting season. 
where it feels like there's not much joy. It feels like I'm dragging my feet through the mud sometimes. There's no traction. It's really hard to just get ahead of steam and get some momentum going. But I found myself in this season, every day that I was going to work, I would get off on Euclid Avenue and I would head back towards the west. I'm coming off, heading, coming, coming from the west and heading back to the west. And I would have this beautiful view of downtown. And I would pray, Lord, send revival to this city. Send revival to this city. Come with your presence. Come with your power. Change hearts. Change minds. Fill the churches. Let people come to you who don't know you. I pray those types of prayers, even though it was the last thing I felt like praying. Just being really honest. It felt like, God, where are you? What's going on? Are you ever going to show up? But I would pray, Lord, send revival. Because I know that I don't want to lose, I don't want to grow weary in doing good. I want to pray big prayers. I still want to press in to his presence. When you do that, when the best way to get ready for tomorrow is to do God's will today. When you are obedient like that, and again, I know it's not easy, it glorifies your Father and it prepares you for what's to come. You know, at its core, waiting is about becoming more like Jesus, relying on God. It's not that waiting is easier and enjoyable, it's obviously very difficult. But in the end, we know this God works through our waiting to make us more like Jesus. You know, we serve an on-time God. He's never early. He's never late. He's always right on time. Which means that waiting serves his purposes in ways we don't always understand. Our call is to be faithful, to wait. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray specifically for anybody in this room that's going through a waiting season. It's in a period of waiting and it feels like uh, they don't know if they can keep holding on. Their maybe head is sinking underwater. I just pray that you would uh, fill them with your presence. A spirit of encouragement this morning would rest upon them. Supernatural strength would come. Supernatural faith and trust would come. That they would have a peace they've not previously experienced. That they would walk away from this morning changed knowing they can keep waiting as long as they need to. They can wait on you because you're always on time. Thank you for the sanctifying work that you're doing in all of us when you make us wait. Thank you here that you're refining us and testing our faith, purifying our motives, and making us ready to receive what you have for us. I pray that you'd pour out on this church an increased measure, that you'd bring people to know you, that we'd be faithful to steward that move but that it would all be in your time and we wouldn't try to force it to happen or take matters into our own hands. Thank you that this is your will, that you want to see increase in your kingdom, and you promise to bring it. In Jesus, in your holy name we pray. Amen. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your Sunday, and we will see you next week. Don't forget, if you're signed up for the uh, class afterwards, uh, we'll meet here in about half an hour, have some Jethro's for lunch. So enjoy, and uh, have a great rest of your day.